empty praise, treasures fade, never enough. Then you came along, put me back together. That free desire is now satisfied. Oh, 
sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Yeah, we'll sing a little louder. In the presence of the enemy. Sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is melody. Oh, sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me. Yeah, we'll sing Welcome again to Mission. It's been so fun today to have Sean Dilbeck with us from Mission City. Uh, so great to worship together and even be reminded in the words of that song that even in the midst of the storm that God is faithful, he's unchanging, and he's not going anywhere. So I don't know how you're doing today and where you're at, but I, I want to take you take a second right now just to give you permission to like ask yourself where you're at, how you're doing. And for us to all take a moment today to remember that one of the things we do when we come in this place and we gather and we worship and we get to hear amazing teaching about God's word and who he is, is that we get to be reminded of his faithfulness to us. And so however you are today, I just want to encourage you to do that for the remainder of, of this time that we have together. And I just, before we jump into the message, want to tell you about a couple things going on around here. Um, first of all, I just want to say welcome if you're new, like if this is your first time. I wonder how you got here. Like, did a friend invite you? Did somebody send you the link? Did you see it on Facebook? Uh, shout out in the chat how you got here and then let us know that you're new. We'd love to connect you any way we can. We even have a free gift that we like to send to you just to, to make sure that you know what, what a pathway to growth looks like here at Mission. We'd love to help you get connected. Um, and then if you need prayer, there's a prayer button uh, on the app too and, and right there on your screen too if you want to ask for prayer or team praise over those requests every Tuesday together. We'd love to come alongside you pray for you this week and then next week two really exciting things are happening first of all we have some new service times so many options for all of us to be able to come and gather together first of all here online same service times 9 30 uh, i mean 9 and 10 30 9 and 10 30 here online and then in the lot we are going to be having services at 9 a.m so right now they're at 10 uh, this week next week they're going to be at an hour earlier at 9 a.m. And then we have two indoor options starting next week, November 15th, uh, one at 11 a.m. and one at 6 p.m. So for the indoor services, masks are going to be required. Um, there's, uh, for now, not going to be mission kids, uh, but, but you don't need a reservation. You can just come and that'll be another opportunity, another option uh, for us to get together and worship together. So that starts next week. Um, so pick whichever one you want and show up and 
again, be ready to worship and gather together in those ways. Um, and then next week, we will also be having baptism uh, for our in-person services, whether it's outside or indoor, you will have the opportunity to get baptized. So if this is something that you've been thinking about or wondering about, um, this isn't something we do once we have it all figured out and have it all together. It's actually the opposite of that. It's when we realize that we need a savior and then we want to tell all the people around us, like, I'm ready to admit that I need a savior. Uh, then we come, we get baptized, and we get to celebrate that together as a church. So that is next week, and you can sign up to be baptized right there on your app. Just click on the sign up button, and um, and you can sign up to be there, and we'll, we'll contact you with all the details. So you can either do that outside or inside as well. Well, at this time in our service, we're going to receive our offering, and we do that lots of different ways. You can give online, you can give through the app, you can text to give. There's going to be a link in the chat that um, you can click on and, and give right there. And I just, I just want to say, it has been incredible the last few months as a church to be able to be the church, even as we haven't gathered in this building, that we've been able to go out and be generous to our community and to the people around us. So thank you for continuing your generosity. For those of you who uh, do automatic online giving, that man, it's just been such a blessing to still be able, even in all of this, to move towards the needs in our community and come alongside people and live generously. And that's something we're really passionate about around here. It's another reason that we do something called item of the month which we haven't been able to do for a while just because of not gathering in person. But now that we're in, doing some in-person gatherings, we are starting item of the month back up this month. And we are partnering with the Christmas shop and collecting toys for kids in the community. So the Christmas shop every year gives away 15,000 toys to Ventura County for people in need, families in need. And it's such a cool organization. So we're partnering with them this month and bringing all kinds of toys uh, for kids ages 10 to 18 like uh, 20, 30 bucks. And then you can even go on your app and you'll see that they have a link in there uh, to their Amazon wish list. You can, you can order the toy right there and it goes straight to the Christmas shop. So it's completely touchless. So cool way to live generously this holiday season. Um, well, we are continuing this incredible series that we've been in, Five Words That Can Change Your Life. Mike Hickerson is here uh, today to, to, to teach us, and it's, it's going to be an awesome day together. I am so glad you are here. Welcome to Mission. Well, what is up, Mission? Welcome online. I'm so honored that Mission's a part of your weekend. Man, I love our church. I love what's going on. It has been a crazy week, and so it's just good to be reminded that God is in control. God is in control of who's in control and that we can trust him. I don't know if you're just checking Mission out for the first time or for the first time in a long time, and I just want to say welcome. We exist as a church to help people find and follow Jesus. That's what we're going after. We're trying to make much of Jesus because he rescues and saves. I don't know where you've been. I don't know what you believe about God or church or the Bible. I get that. This is a safe place to be um, a part of a, a group of imperfect people. In fact, on this chat today, there are a group of imperfect people. The people that attend mission in person or the people that are in the parking lot or the people that you will engage with at mission as a family. We are imperfect, but we serve a really, really, really perfect God who rescues and saves and sent Jesus into the mess for us, uh, for the worst of us and the worst in us so that it could be bought back and we could be restored stored back to much loved sons and daughters of him and that has brought so much joy and hope to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that are part of the mission family and man I, I'm just so honored to be part honored to be in this journey we've been in this series where we said okay there's five words that can change your life we're not smart enough to do any other words so we're just doing five words that can that can change your life and we, we kicked it off with the word help we said that help is kind of hard for us to say about ourselves. It's really easy to say, well, you need help. It's really difficult for us to say, I need help. And so we said, if we want our lives to change, if we really want to be the best versions of us, what we're going after together, what God wants for us, we got to learn how to let go and say, you know what, I, I, need, I need help. I don't have it all figured out. I, I, when I drive my life, I end up in the ditch over and over again. And then last week, we walked through the word sorry. Taylor Hunt, our student pastor, did an incredible message uh, about the fences in our life that we build up. You need to check out that message. If you haven't seen that message, you can just stop now and go watch that message and catch back up. But it was an incredible message. Great job, Taylor. Today, we're going to walk through the shortest word, no. Uh, then we'll walk through the word yes, and I am so pumped next weekend at mission and physical, physically in the audience 
auditorium. We're in, in the parking lot. We're going to be doing baptisms. And so we want to say a big yes to God that he can change our lives. I'm so excited about that. And then we'll wrap up the five words that can change your life with the word thanks. So, you know, around here, if you've ever been around Ventura or maybe in anywhere which kind of populated, we have a, a Starbucks that's kind of by the, the church building where my office is. And it is like, it's a new one, but it is the worst parking lot of all time. It's like whoever designed it, I love you. If you go to mission, don't be too mad at me. It's just a really difficult parking lot because it's a drive through and Ventura's not used to driving through and we don't know how to park and everybody gets in and doesn't know how to let people go. So I like pulled in, I'm getting ready to go to a meeting. I pre-ordered my Starbucks because it's so convenient. I can, you know, just order it on the phone. And there's this guy that gets into his car he's getting ready to get out of his car he's like ready you know it's like the reverse lights are on I don't know if he starts playing a game on his phone if he starts talking on his phone if he's like trying to figure out what you know music he needs but I'm like needing to park so I can go get my coffee so I can go to my meeting and he's not moving been there where you get a little impatient I mean I wasn't impatient I was just so I did what any like normal person would do. I, I got out of my car just to see if he needed any help because obviously he, if he didn't need help, he would have been moving by now. And I was just going to say, cause I needed that spot and everyone was like trying to figure out how to get into this spot. And I needed that spot cause I just need my coffee so we can go. And I just like went and was like, Hey, are you good? And he like rolled down the window. It wasn't like the 1980s kind. It was the electric kind. And he rolled down the window and he's like, Oh, mission church, pastor Mike. And I'm like, yes, yes. I, I was just coming to see if I could pray for you, brother. That is all I was coming to check on. Um, no, honestly, that didn't happen, but it very well could have happened. But what happens, what I actually learned about and I read this week is that in the Journal of Applied Psychology, did you know that we will, we will purposely take longer when somebody is waiting for our spot? We will purposely wait at the restaurant longer when somebody needs our table. We will purposely like, like fidget with some stuff in our car when we know somebody's like impatiently trying to get into our spot. So as Christmas t comes, just be the kind people that when you get into your parking spot, get out so other people can park. But it's called territorialism. And what I'm learning is that we do this with God all the time. And if we want our lives to change, we're going to have to get good at saying no to territorialism where we've got all this stuff in our life with God. The problem with my life, and I don't know if it's the problem with your life, but what I'm finding, the problem with my life is just so crammed full of stuff and burdens and obligations. And then I get like this resentment and busyness and hurry that there's no space for God. Or no time for God, no time for God's word, no time for a relationship with God, no time to grow spiritually, no time for depth of friendship, no time for depth, depth of, to examine the character stuff going on in me, no time to serve, no time to give, no time to volunteer, no time to invite. Like I got no time because I've got like all this space guarded for me. We're in such a hurry that we can only do five simple words that can change your life. And today we're in such a hurry that we got to do the shortest one. So I want us to just channel this together and you're getting ready to type it into the chat or you can yell it loud if you want to, wherever you are. We're just gonna get good. If we want our lives to change, we gotta get good at saying the word no. So type it in, exclamation point, multiple times, whatever you need to do. I want you to channel. So on the count of three, I want you to channel your inner two-year-old self because that was the time that you were so comfortable saying no. You got really good at saying no when you were two. But I want us to count to three, and I want us to just get really good at saying no. Ready? One, two, three. No. And no can change our life. No is this wonderful gift. And the reason, and this is one of the things we'll learn, the reason that we can say no to a lesser good thing is so that we can say yes to a greater good thing. And we'll talk about that next week. There's this quote I love from this author named Sean Aniquis. It says this, and so if you like me, have said too many yeses and, ha and found all that hopeful, exciting, wide open intention has actually left you scraped raw and empty, the word that can change everything is no, no. But I know, I don't like it either, Shauna says. Yes, yes is fun and sparkly and printed on tote bags, no. I mean, what if you saw someone wearing a sweatshirt that just said no? Like who would, I don't want to sit next to that bundle of fun, but no for her became the scalpel I wielded as I remade my life. No is powerful. 
And I just want to give us a little clue. If we want God to do something great in our life, if we want to make some space for God to show up in our world and in our relationships and in our families and in our situation and in our heart and in our mind and in our soul and in our lives, and we're going to have to get okay with saying no. If we're going to let God have some space, so we got to get good at saying no. If we want our lives to change to the best version of what it could be and what God has for us, we may have to get okay with saying no. You know, we all have that thing. Some of us are, have those things, that temptation that we wrestle through. So pretending that we don't have that thing is just lying to ourselves. We all have that thing out there that like left to ourselves, we would go to that hurt or that habit or that hang up or that internal thing that we wrestle with or that mental thing that we wrestle with or that addiction thing that we wrestle with. There is all that thing. And what I'm learning about temptation is that it is universal. We are in a chat, we are in a room, we are anyone watching this, everyone in this room, everyone that will ever attend mission, everyone that's engaging with this video online, we are in a room of messed up people that are tempted to do the things that we would never want to do, but we can find help and hope here and it may start with the word no. Some of us have that thing, that temptation that's universal, whether it be pride or him, or her, or stuff, or money, or sex, or anger, or food, or alcohol, or envy, or approval, or a critical judgmental spirit, or success in an unhealthy way, or unforgiveness, or, un or resentment, whatever it is, to act like we don't have that thing is going to train wreck our lives, because we all have that thing that we need to get good at saying no to. Hebrews 4, 15 would say it this way, this way, this high priest, Jesus like the one we serve that rescued us of ours, he understands our weaknesses because he faced all of the same testings that we do, yet he did not sin. Temptation is universal. Temptation is also relentless. You, it's a day-by-day -day thing, sometimes moment-by-moment thing. You gotta put on your big girl and your big boy pants to take on temptation. It's not like 40 days and I can kick this habit. It's one of those things that it's gonna come at after us every single day. That thing will always show up to take us out because if we're gonna do anything great for God, we gotta get good at saying no to the temptation that universally and relentlessly comes after us. And also what I'm learning about temptation is that it knows our weaknesses. It knows right where we're weak and it knows in the exact time where we're weak or they're hurt or angry or lonely or tired or whatever it may be, it comes right, I mean, I have given the enemy such great film of my life that it knows exactly how to attack my life in the areas that I'm weak with temptation. So I've gotta get good at saying no. And all of us have that thing. And if we're gonna get good at saying no, we want our lives to change, we gotta get really comfortable with saying no to some of the temptation areas in our life that will take us out. And I think maybe it's just helpful to remind ourselves what's at stake with our no to temptation because sometimes when we get in the moment, it's too far gone. We're not ready to say no because all we can think about is what we want or need in that moment and we haven't thought that what's at stake every time we don't say no to temptation. So what's at stake with our no to temptation? My future is at stake every time that I'm tempted with that thing. Every time. The direction I want my life to go, the who I want to be, the character of my life, the where I'm going, the what I want God to do with my life, the what you want God to do with your life. Every time we're tempted with that thing and we don't say no, our future is at stake. Every time we're tempted with that thing and we don't say no to that temptation, my family's at stake. The people that I have influence over, the people that I impact and if I want like, my life to be the best possible version of myself, I've got to get great at saying no, not just for me, but for those that I have influence over. And some of you, you know this. If you could rewind to your mom or your dad that was, had a terrible no muscle to the temptations in their life, their inability to say no train wrecked your childhood. What would it be worth for you to rewind and your mom or dad, whatever that thing was that took them out, that they didn't realize in the moment was the temptation that they couldn't say no to, that had massive impact over not just their life and their future, but your whole family line, what would it be worth? You know there's more at stake every time we don't say no to temptation. Our future and our family is at stake. You can be a cycle breaker against that thing and learn how to say no 
And every time what I'm learning is my faith is also at stake. My faith in a God that he is who he says he is and he will do everything that he promised to do and I can trust him and he will provide for me. Every time, every time that I am tempted and I don't say no, it dings my faith, it limits my faith, it, 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 it like hurts my trust in God because I don't think he can or wants to. In fact, every temptation is a test of our faith in God, not just our white-knuckled self-control. Every time. Love God or hate God. We gotta get good at saying no against temptation because every time we give in and don't say no, it just takes a little hit of our faith because we're not sure if God can, wants to, or will be trusted. We think, can God come through for us? Will God come through for us? Does God wanna come through for us? Is he big enough to handle my loneliness? I mean, we don't say this stuff in the moment, but what it's doing is I've gotta find another way to take care of me because God won't do it. Do I have to find my own path to intimacy? Is it up to me to keep my company moving forward? Is the weight on my shoulders? Will God provide for my family? Because we think it's about now and we think it's about me. Temptation, the ability to say no to the things that will take us out from what God has called us to be is massively important if we want our lives to change. I just, I just want us to be encouraged because Jesus walked through this. And what we're gonna walk through today in Matthew 4 is we're gonna hang out. Jesus gets tempted and he was great at saying no to some areas because he knew exactly who he was and he knew exactly what God had called him to. And I want that so bad for us. So we're gonna watch and we're gonna look and see how Jesus did it so that maybe we can take some lessons and then maybe develop some practices that will help our no muscle us get good at saying no to the things that are gonna take us off course of who God has called us to be. So let's dive in. Matthew 4 is where we're gonna be. It'll be on the screen. If you have a Bible in front of you, that's great. If you need another device, grab that or grab whatever you need. So we're gonna start in Matthew 3, actually. I just wanted to get these couple of verses. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. Okay, if you're like, I, I, I don't, know what's going on here. So what you gotta know, this is like the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He hasn't gone public with anything. He hasn't done anything. Like he's getting ready to start off on this whole journey of his life of what God has called him to. And it's this signifying moment where he's getting baptized, uh, not because he needed remission of sins or like his sins to be gone, but he's getting baptized out of obedience of what God has called him to, kind of setting him apart. And then like heaven opens up and all of a sudden we hear the voice of God say this, a voice from heaven, God said, this is my son like identity and relationship, whom I love, acceptance. With him, I am well pleased. I mean, I love that because if, if Jesus needed to know that from God, I just want you to know this is what God would want to say to us. This is my son or daughter. Because when God looks at us, those of us that God, Jesus has paid the price for, he sees the perfection of his son. This is my son or daughter whom I love. With him, with her, I am well pleased. He says that to Jesus in this moment. I love I love that. And what I'm learning is that if I am clear on my identity, if you are clear on your identity and clear on the mission for your life, you will get clear on when to say no. Hey, hallelujah. If you are clear on your identity and clear on your mission, you will get clear on when to say no. But you have to know who you are in Christ and what you are called to do so that you can say no to the right things. Matthew 4, 1 and 2, the very next verse after Jesus, this is my son whom I love and him am well pleased. Then Jesus was led into the, spill, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Wait a minute, Jesus going, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought you loved me. I thought you were pleased with me. Like you're bringing me out to the wilderness after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Like maybe the most obvious three words in the Bible, he, he was hangry. Like 40 days and 40 nights, like he did without for 40 days and 40 nights. He wasn't tempted when everything was good. He wasn't tempted when he was physically strong. He wasn't tempted when he had been around community for a while, 40 days and 40 nights. And then when he was hungry, then the temptation began with him. In fact, this is where we get the idea of Lent right here, those 40 days and 40 nights without, like sometime in February, we're leading up to Easter that we're, you know, you kind of do without, you know, like what we do for Lent, you know, Jesus did without food for 40 days and 40 nights. We do things without like chocolate or you know, alcohol, because we're super, you know, sacrificial in our giving up stuff in Lent. And or we do stuff like social media, but we have to tell everybody on social media that we gave up social media. Anyway, it's complicated. Anyway, that was free. But what happens in he's tempted away, he's hungry. Temptation number one for Jesus. You've probably never been tempted with this, but to turn stones into bread. Matthew 4, 3 says it this way. 
the tempter came to him after he was hungry, if, I mean, if you are the son of God. Temptation always comes after our identity. Remember, God had to remind, God was going, no, no, this is my son, whom I love. In him, I'm well pleased. And the tempter's going like, well, I mean, if, if you are the son of God, you are the son of God, right? Well, yeah, I'm the son of God. Well, you, you can do this, right? You can tell these stones to become bread. You have that ability to do that. You can do that, right? Because if you're the son of God, you'd be able to do that. And you are hungry. What's going what's gonna to matter if you're hungry? You can make these things. If you are the son of God, you, could, you should be able to take care of yourself. And Jesus understands, and he's way smarter than us, but I think it's helpful for us to understand what Jesus understands in this moment. It's not that Jesus was hungry, but the issue is, can I continue to trust my father to provide for me, or do I need to take care of myself? Every time I'm tempted, every time Jesus is tempted, it's an attack on our faith, our family, or our future. So for us, for me, the temptation, not stones to bread, but for me, the temptation is to meet a very real need the wrong way. Or you could say, I am what I have. I need to be able to provide for myself. I need to be able to make mine. I got to define myself by the stuff that I have. I should never have an appetite that doesn't go satisfied. I need it. I want it. I got it. I bought it. Whatever it is, you, found your, you, you find our identity on just about everything, whether it be nice, shiny stuff or a nice, shiny car or the fact that you don't need nice, shiny stuff or don't need a nice, shiny car or a nice job or a lot of money or a lot of clothes. I mean, this is an attack on the, my confidence in God because I don't know if God will meet my needs the way that I want them met, so I'm going to meet a very real need the wrong way. Can you see how it takes away my future and my faith, potentially my family? I don't know if God can, will, wants to. I don't know if he knows he needs to come through for me. So if I'm not sure that if God is going to come through for me, then I better go get mine on my own. I don't stop and think in the moment, can God meet this need for me? How would God meet this need for me? Is he big enough to meet our need for loneliness or intimacy or progress or provide for our family or do something in our marriage? And any time, every time that I'm kind of, I'm not tempted to turn stones into bread, but more often than not, I get tempted all the time to meet a very real need the wrong way. Been there? Man, I love Jesus' response because like he actually is going back to some of the Old Testament in the Bible. He's going, man, Jesus answered in Matthew 4, 4, he says it this way, it is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And he's reaching back into the people of God's history, going, you remember when our people wandered in the desert or in the wilderness for four, I'm in the wilderness for 40 days. They were in it for 40 years, but God provided every day what they needed for that day. God provided literal food, manna, what is it? That, and we, he's like, I remember, it is written, God provides our physical needs. God has this way of connecting, meeting our physical needs, our very real needs, God connects to his faithfulness. So I would just say, what is the very real need that we are tempted to meet in a, in a very real need that we're tempted to meet in a wrong way? And we gotta get good at saying no to it. There's this quote from Miroslav Volv that says this way, when we live by bread alone, there is never enough bread. Not enough even when we make so much of it that it seems to rot away. When we live by bread alone, we always want more and better bread. So maybe for us, my response needs to be, I don't live on blank alone. Whatever that thing is. Whatever that hurt or habit or hang up, whatever that pride or whatever that thing that we go to, that we meet a very real need in the wrong way, whatever that thing, I just need to be able to say to it, I don't live on that alone. Because I believe in God that he is who, I, that he, is who he says he is and will do everything that he promised to do. So the practice, what we want to get good about, not just knowing stuff, but doing stuff, is maybe I need to do without some stuff. That idea of like, it's a kind of a Christian word, it's a like, fasting. And fasting is like to, means I temporarily refrain from consuming what I ordinarily would consume for my own needs. Like it's that cookie monster theology or that cookie monster idea. What cookie monster does is he sees a cookie, wants a cookie, eats a cookie. And there are geniuses that are trying to market to all of us to say, you, you have like cookie monster needs. You see that thing, you want that thing, you have that thing. 
And the cookies change and they get more expensive and they get more dangerous, but we've got to get great at saying no to it. So fasting is going like, sometimes it's a fast for me. It's not a way to get God to work for me so that I'm, look how good I'm doing and so you should give me what I want because I'm fasting until you give me what I want. It's not like a hunger strike against God so it'll give you what you want, but you can fast from food. It's not like a look good in 40 days plan. That's not what fasting is. Fasting is doing without because I trust that God will provide for me and I don't need to meet a physical need, a very real need in a wrong way. I'm trusting that God is who he says he is and he'll provide for me. So Some people fast from food for a certain amount of time and replace it with connection with God. Some of us may need to fast from purchasing because we have very real needs that we tend to meet in very wrong ways and we use it by purchasing everything that we can because it makes us feel better. So we may need to fast from that and do without some stuff. Some of us may need to put like the technology fast, this thing that buzzes all the time and tells me I'm important and needed I may need to put this away. It's a very real need to be like, accepted, but I may need to put it away and realize that only comes from God and the world will keep spinning if I don't have this on. Second temptation for us and for Jesus is to throw yourself down. Matthew 4, 5, and 6 says it this way. It said, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, then throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike a foot against a stone. You're like, well, I've never been tempted to you know, go up above the city and throw myself down because God would protect me. But what I have been tempted on for me, what this temptation is, is to manipulate God to work for me on my time frame because I am what I do. This temptation is like to presume on God, like, God, I know better than you. I've got a plan. You need to hurry up your plan for my life. So I'll go ahead and like get ahead of you and kind of get you there so that you'll bail me out of the situations that I get on, get in. Jesus' response in Matthew 4, 7, Jesus answered, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And my response, what I need my response to be when this temptation comes, like, no, 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 no. I will not get ahead of God. With Jesus at the beginning of his ministry right here, He goes into the wilderness for 40 days. That's where he is right now. He doesn't give a talk. He doesn't draw a crowd. He doesn't recruit a team. He doesn't train anybody up. He doesn't write a book. He doesn't heal a disease. He does nothing because nothing is really important to do for people who are trying to do a lot. For people who think I am what I do, doing nothing for the right reasons is really important to do quite a bit. Here's the thing about Jesus. If you want to follow him, you have to stay behind him. And that's what I'm learning. He goes off into the wilderness and he does nothing. He goes off into dark and quiet places and he does nothing. He goes off on the mountaintops which are beautiful and he does nothing. He gets into a garden when his life is really difficult and the pressure is great and he does nothing other than connect with his father. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So the practice I need to get good at in these moments. I need to say no to no margin living. I need to create some margin. It's this churchy word called Sabbath where people would say, I'm gonna work this hard. It's maybe the most violated of the 10 commandments. It's a day where we intentionally take time away from being productive in the means of trying to be somebody because I am what I do and we let God be the ruler of the universe and we just connect with him. It's that creating margin. I need to say no to things so that I can create margin of space where God can speak into just like your English teacher used to do when you had the big chief tablet. In the margin, there would be correction or encouragement or information or next steps. But we have lived lives with no no's. So we say yes all the time and we have no margin for God to speak because we get wrapped in the temptation that I am what I do. Been there? Temptation number three for Jesus was to bow down and get the world. Matthew 4, 8, 9, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Well, I've never been asked by the devil to bow down and worship him, but I have, for me, the temptation is to take a shortcut to the destination that God has me. We're all tempted to take the shortcut and do it our way instead of God's way, and that's because we get into this idea that we are what people think about us or what people can see. We get addicted to progress. The temptation always will be to take a short cut. When you think about Jesus 
and how he had to be just ironclad and that he was accepted by his father because he literally got rejected by every, he disappointed everyone in his life except for his father. The crowd said to him, we want you to be our king because man, you could defeat all of our enemies. And he said, no, and disappointed them. The religious leaders, the Pharisees said, you're not living up to our standards of righteousness and you're hanging out with all the wrong people. Stop doing that. And he said, no and disappointed them. His mom and his brothers came up and said, you're acting crazy, you need to come home and stop all this insanity. And he said, no, and disappointed them. Herod said to him, do a miraculous sign and so I can be wowed. And he said, no, and disappointed Herod. James and John said, let us sit on your right and on your left. And he said, no, and disappointed them. He disappointed all the rest. He disappointed every single person in his life with a no, except the will of his father. He said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Jesus' response to this last temptation is Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. My response, what I need to do when I'm tempted to take the shortcut, is that I need to remember that I need to trust God's plan for my life. My practice I need to do is that maybe we need to go out with some hum- go, go without some human approval of trying to prove ourselves or be better, or care so much what people think about us except for our Father. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to wrap this up. We're going to get good at saying no, because if we want the life that God has for us, if we want our life to change, we've got to get really good at saying no, like channel that two-year-old self for the, wrong, for the right reasons. So we've got to say, and I'm, you're going to ask you to repeat after me, and if you're a guy, you're like, I'm not going to do that. Well, just, just go with me here, because I think this week, it's going to have some power if we'll let it, that we can actually defeat temptation. So what we're going to say, this is what we're going to say, temptation You will not steal my future. You will not steal from my family. And you will not steal my faith. Woo. No. I can say no to you, temptation. That thing. And we're just going to say with conviction. You're going to say it with me. All right? Wherever you are, we're in this together. Temptation. You will not steal my future. You will not steal my family. And you will not steal my faith. This week, when temptation comes, when that thing comes, when we're tempted to realize that we are what we do, or we are what people think about us, or we are what we have, may we remind ourselves that God is who he says he is. And we can say no to all that because he can be trusted. Why don't you pray? God, you're good and you're great. And thank you that we get to see that Jesus was tempted and hungry. And then we can relate to the high priest of ours that paid that price. And go, God, we're not tempted with what exactly he was tempted with, but the kind of style and things that we're tempted with around our identity, we absolutely are. So God, may we get good over this next season at saying no to the things that take us off track. In Jesus' name I pray. Confess, bowing here, I find my rest. But without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, grace is more. Grace is found, that's where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is 
is Christ in me. He is where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Temptation comes my way When I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay When I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay great reminder that that God is our hope and stay and I needed to hear that today and I needed to be reminded that yeah I need you God and even in the face of temptation to really remember what's at stake that that God I want you to to take control of my future my family my faith like you're in charge of it all and um and I'm going to surrender that to you and so I hope that that was encouraging for you today man it sure was for me uh, just a couple quick reminders next week lots of lots of service options are coming your way so remember online services are the same time as they uh, are now which is 9 and 10 30 and then um in the lot we'll be we'll be gathering in the lot uh, at 9 a.m and then indoor at 11 a.m 6 p.m starting next week November 15th and and uh, don't forget to sign up for baptism if that's something you're interested in or just want more information about. Um, just, just go to the app and click the sign up button and then you'll find all the information you need right there. So glad you were here today. I hope you have an awesome week and we will see you next weekend.